Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good. Nice to see you. I'm Debbie Himmelfarb. Hello. Director of Daytime Programs at 92Y Tribeca. Thank you for coming. We have a very interesting talk about the great Stella Adler here. Um, and we have three people who are all have all been associated with her in a different way. So it's very, very interesting. Um, we're excited to hear what they have to say. So I will give fuller introductions in a second, but first, please welcome Peter Bogdanovich, Robert Perillo, and Victoria Wilson. for the introductions. Peter Bogdanovich is a director, producer, writer, actor, film critic, and author. He's directed more than 25 feature films, including international award winners, including The Last Picture Show, What's Up Doc, and Paper Moon, as well as cult favorites, Texasville and Noises Off. Among the many stars he's introduced are Sybil Shepard, Tatum O'Neill, and Sandra Bullock, and many more. And he was a recurring guest star on the popular HBO series, The Sopranos. And Peter, as you probably know, studied with Stella Adler. So we'll be hearing more about that. Uh, Robert Perillo is a master voice teacher who has trained actors for over 30 years. He has worked at the National Shakespeare Conservatory, NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, and the Stella Adler School of Acting, where he was head of the voice department. So Robert brings the um, point of view of someone who actually worked with Stella. And Victoria Wilson, our moderator, is an editor at Alfred A. Knopf, as well as vice president and associate publisher. And among the many authors she has worked with include Stella Adler, Lauren Bacall, Peter Bogdanovich, James Curtis, Christopher Plummer, Sapphire, and many more. She's currently at work on a biography of Barbara Stanwyck to be published by Simon & Schuster next year. We hope you'll come back, Vicki, for that one. So Barbara, Barbara Stanwyck will be a talk coming up. And as if all this isn't enough, Victoria is Stella Adler's stepdaughter. So uh, I also should mention, hello, welcome that this program coincides with the publication of the book, Stella Adler on America's Master Playwrights. And we have copies of this book for sale if you'd like to purchase right over in the corner after the talk. And our panel has generously agreed to sign copies. So we can do that after the talk. Um, now, get ready. We're going to have some conversation with our panelists. We're going to turn over to audience Q&A in a little bit. Um, and then at the very end, you're going to have a treat. We've, uh, Victoria has put together a short clip of the great Stella Adler herself. So we're going to let Stella have the last word today when we're all done. So thanks for coming, and I'll turn it over to Vicki. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're here. It's great that everybody's here. We're here, of course, to celebrate Stella Adler. And, um, Stella would not approve. <laughs> Speak out. Do not be shy, she would say. And so we're, as I'll say it again, welcome everybody. We're here, of course, to celebrate Stella Adler, who uh, the story of her being a stepmother is quite a story, but I'll save that perhaps for another time. And uh, Peter and I, on, in the car down were arguing about where we first met Stella. Uh, where, where Peter and I first met, I said it was at a party that Stella had. He, he said, no, no, it was, we were just, uh, it was a small gathering. But nevertheless, we met through Stella and um, that began a long, wonderful relationship. I've published Peter for many years. And I just want to say that Robert Perillo was a voice teacher at Stella's, and he is one of the great, great voice teachers of all time. I know because I have studied with him for years. And um, he actually worked with her. Peter studied with her. So I, to start it off, I just thought 
it would be interesting for each of you to talk about how you met Stella and what your impressions of her were. So Peter, why don't we start with you? Well, I met her when I was 16. I lied and said I was 18 to get into her classes because you had to be 18 or, or over. And I was tall and so I looked, it was believable that I was 18, but I was 16. And I was with her for four years. I studied with her for four years. And Stella was such an extraordinary teacher. It wasn't just about acting. She taught everything, uh, theater, everything about the theater. And uh, she really taught directing. So I could say that I learned to direct from her as well. Um, she was a great inspiration, uh, an extraordinary teacher, very, very funny. I loved her dearly. She, I knew her for many, many years. I, she sort of became my second mother. Well, Peter, when you first saw her, what did you think? I never met anybody like that before. <laughs> <laughs> she was very theatrical. Uh, there's a marvelous story where she's in, she, was, she was in England, and somebody said, where should we deliver this? And she said uh, to my uh, home in New York, I said, oh, I thought you were English. She says, no, just affected. Because <laughs> she had a kind of a way of talking that's, that was inimitable. And, uh, well, how did you get to, what made you decide to go to her school? I was in a season of summer theater as an apprentice. And one of the other apprentices, and, uh, one of the other apprentices who was considerably older than I was. I was, as I said, 16, 15, turned 16 that, that summer. Um, he had been studying with Stella, and he recommended her very highly. So when I came back from the summer theater, I, I joined up. And uh, I didn't regret it. I, it was a great experience. And, uh, and Robert, <coughs> how did he how did talk, talk about how you met her? Uh, I met her on the day she interviewed me for the job of voice teacher at her studio. Uh, the office at the studio was about this big, and Sella had a little section of it which was divided by a theatrical screen, like you might see in an actress's dressing room. And I walked in, the secretary greeted me, and suddenly they moved the screen, and there she was. <laughs> Blouse cut down to here fabulously made up hair, and she said, sit down, darling. So I did. And she said, I'd like you to teach speech. And I was young and brash, and uh, though I knew I was in the presence of royalty, I said to her, well, Stella, you can't teach speech without teaching voice. She said, very good, darling. <laughs> and she asked me to explain what that meant. And in my limited knowledge at the time, I told her. She said, good, darling. And that's how it began. <laughs> and my life took a path the day she hired me. Had she not hired me, I don't know where I'd be today. Uh, maybe working for the Department of Sanitation or being an actor. I don't know. But it led to me being a teacher. And had you, <clears throat> I mean, you went there on a deliberately, obviously, to be hired for the job, right? Yes, I was recommended by one of her faculty, uh, Mario Saletti, who was a protege of Stella's. And I had spent a summer working at a, a theatrical camp up in the Catskills, and Mario loved me, and he said, you're a great teacher, and it just so happened they needed a voice teacher, so he recommended me to Stella, and it's about, always, it's always about being in the right place at the right time. And and that, that began my career because then I had full-time employment working at her studio and one job led to another and all of a sudden I was a voice teacher. <laughs> and the way, I, I'll just say, the way I met Stella was that I was in uh, my, uh, my lunchroom at high school and minding my own business and a friend of mine said, <clears throat> so I hear your father is dating Stella Adler. <laughs> and I said, who the hell is Stella Adler? As sophisticated as a family as I came from, I had never heard of her. And, you know, then she said, oh, well, she's this great teacher, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, well, I'm not too happy about this. And it just so happened that that night, I, it's amazing that I remember this, Stella appeared, was on television on the Steve Allen show. 
So I got a look at her. And when I first went to the apartment to see my father, and I walked into this apartment, which was at 1016 Fifth Avenue. Now, my father was this extremely elegant man, very well dressed, very distinguished. However, he was a simple, I mean, he was a complicated man, but he was, it was, it was very elegant. And I walk into this apartment and I see gilt angels and cupids everywhere <laughs> and brocades. And I mean, it was, it was definitely a mini Versailles. And I thought, oh my God, what, what has happened? And I walk into the library, and, which she sort of shoved off onto my father and said, okay, you can have, this is where you can work. And it was stripped down and it was, you know, sort of recognizable. And they eventually, I, I remember they rented this house that was um, for the summer. It was um, uh, Jerome Robbins' house out at the beach. And there were beaded curtains everywhere. But I, could, I didn't remember that it was Jerome Robbins. I thought it was Stella's house with the beaded curtains. And the whole thing was like a total state of shock for me. When they bought the house in Watermill, I would arrive at the house, and Stella would, at those days I smoked, I would walk in the house, and Stella would hand me an ashtray. <laughs> and she'd say, here, darling, here's your ashtray for the weekend. Do not, do not let it go. <laughs> so anyway. Um, Peter, talk a little bit about what uh, Stella taught you. I mean, talk about, you know, what, well, first of all, talk a little bit about what it was like to be a student of hers. Well, it was every time you'd go for a class, it was a, a kind of an extraordinary performance because Stella was uh, an actress and uh, it wasn't, she didn't just teach, she sort of played a great teacher, you know? Um, and she was a great teacher. I don't know how to describe what she taught. I, it was, I was y very young, so a lot of things went over my head, but it sounded awfully impressive. <laughs> and um, I came to understand, reading this book, as a matter of fact, I came to understand a lot of things that I hadn't quite completely grasped, because I was too young. But, she, she, her teaching was so inclusive that she just taught you everything about the theater. And um, in fact, I mean, she, she, she could be terribly funny, you know. I remember one time she was watching uh, an actor doing the soliloquy from Hamlet, and he was just terrible. And the students, we all looked at each other. The guy was really from hunger. And um, Stella watching very intently. <laughs> then she would rub her breast for some reason. <laughs> she did that quite often. But she was so into it and she, he was going on and she was into the play and into the scene and fo completely intense. And we thought, How, what is she, she, she's look into this and this guy really sucks. Well, the guy finished and he was just dreadful, as I said. And Stella just sat there for a minute and then she stood up and she said, well, it's a great play. <laughs> That's how she dealt with that. <laughs> Another time she said, you have to believe. When you're on the stage, you have to believe. If you believe, the audience will believe. I was on the stage once and I had to open a drawer and take out a gun and shoot. And one night, there was no gun in the drawer. So I went, bang! And everybody believed it. <laughs> <laughs> and Robert, you, you know, you became, a, you've become a director and you coach actors. So tell us what she taught, you know, what you learned from watching her. Acting, much acting is uh, taught as a mechanical thing. Like, like arithmetic, one and one is always two. Stella did something else. She probably wasn't an acting teacher. She was more than an acting teacher. She taught you, and this is what I learned, because my own schooling had been very much about, you know, playing um, 
uh, if you understand anything about acting, playing an intention, having a need, how to handle a cup, uh, how to walk through a door, uh, having um, you know, a million little things like that, very mechanical. But she said plays were more than that. They were set in a time, they were written by a human being who had a whole baggage out of which the plays came. So she made you examine the, the story, its intent, and its meaning. Whereas in many acting classes, you acted a scene and no one ever mentioned what the playwright thought or you know, what his background was, why he wrote the play. That's what she did and she was extraordinary at it. She made you understand that a play is not just a play. It's a moment in history out of, and coming out of an artist's uh, need to say something or maybe to even exercise his own spirits. Um, That's what the book does. Yes. It gives you the sense of that. Tons the of that. The book gives you that sense of that. She was very focused on the playwright's text and what the playwright had in mind and what he, where he came from and the background and what his whole biography, so to speak. Exactly. I mean, in so many acting classes I took, no one ever mentioned the text. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. They did not mention the text. Hmm. We would do Chekhov scenes, we would do Odette's, no mention of the text. It was just, how are you feeling? Oh, that, that was just, yeah, she terrible. focused on the text. Yes. You can't play Tennessee Williams the way you play Shakespeare. And you can't play Shakespeare the way you play Arthur Miller. Everybody's different. And she was right. She talked about the style of the play, and she was very into that, the understa understanding of the style of the playwright and how, it's, how each playwright has a different style, and you have to play it in a different way. Well, she talked about the context of the time that yes. the play was written. Right. That's mm -hmm. what you had to study. You had to understand. You couldn't just pick up the words, because you wouldn't understand the words unless you understood the time that you know what was going on in that society and whether what the what the class was mm -hmm. and um, it's interesting for people who have read this book or people who are going to buy this book at the end of this event you are going to see that what she writes about when you after you've read the whole extraordinary book is that these playwrights were in a moment in transition that's what she's talking about, yeah. and that they were, that they wrote out of that transition, that they wrote out of that alienation. And I met up with Stella again, because my father died very early, suddenly of a heart attack, and we didn't see each other for a long time. I thought, okay, well, that's enough of that. And I ran into her stepdaughter on the subway, and she invited me for Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, her into Ellen, her daughter, on the subway. She invited me for Thanksgiving dinner. And I hesitated, but I went. And it was interesting, because Stella looked at me, and she probably saw my father. And I looked at her, and I saw my father. And so we sort of bonded again on that level. And I, it was a time when I was publishing Tennessee Williams' letters to Maria St. Just. And I then... She asked me to come to the house, so I went to the house, and I asked her if I could go and take, listen to her Tennessee Williams classes. And she said yes. And so I left my office. I think it was, she was still at City Center, mm -hmm. but my office was on the east side then. And I got there, and she started. I mean, the class was there, and she walked in, and everybody stood up and applauded. And she sat at this little black table like this with a chair that was like a throne. And she proceeded to talk, and my life changed. My life completely changed at that moment because <clears throat> as I listened to her, I heard somebody talking about life, civilization, God, human beings, how to think about art, how to think about creativity, how just to think. And nobody was speaking that way in the world. Yeah. There was nobody who spoke that way. And yeah. so what happened after that was that I went back to, that, to those classes every day. 
Every day I left my office at four o'clock. And I realized, in sort of talking to both of you and reading this book and thinking about this book, she was extraordinary. I mean, she was an amazing human being, but that was not what she was put on earth to be. She wasn't put on earth to be a mother or, she was put on earth to, as a teacher, she was totally available and totally open, and that's the way I connected with her. And we both sort of fell in love with each other, and I spent, you know, I would go to the class and then we would have dinners together after. And um, this book, I, you know, I mean, for instance, there's, um, at one point she says, Oh, I'll just read you this funny story, she says. I'll tell you a little story to illustrate <clears throat> something. <clears throat> I did a film <clears throat> in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was starring in it, but my film couldn't be screened if I was billed under the name of Adler. You may not believe this, but it's true. Paramount couldn't release it. They said it's not good in the South for a marquee to have the name Adler on it. People, will, people might think it's Jewish. Eddie Robinson changed his name, she's saying, Stella's writing. And Muni had to do it, and Sylvia Sidney, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> all the ethnic stars had to change their names. Otherwise, there was no way you could be on a marquee. So they told me to change it, and I said, it's not mine to change. It was given to me, I can't change it. The lawyers met, but the studio refused to budge and finally had to say, and I finally had to say, spell it any way you like, but I'm saying it's Adler. And so they released it with the name with her name as Ardler. She says, I'm not making this up. They thought Ardler sounded more Gentile or less Jewish or some goddamn thing. <laughs> when I told Luther Adler, her brother, about it, he said, Ardler? Why didn't they just change it to Beverly Wilshire? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, at a certain point, she is saying, um, This is an interesting uh, question where she says, she's saying, happy children should not try to be artists. You have to be born with a broken heart and a sense of loneliness inside. I never had a happy moment as a child myself. It's very important for actors to know that loneliness is the center of your profession. You are alone whether you are rehearsing or acting. You are alone in public. When you are acting, you are alone with many people. Loneliness is at the center of the creative artist's emotional life. And when I read that, I was surprised and wondered if you had each seen any of that in her. No. Perhaps I, I was very surprised to read that. Yes, I was too, but perhaps I thought maybe that's why she was always so active every night, parties, yeah. in the opera, yeah. uh, to, to suppress that or... Yeah, she was a, a great party goer, and I took and her to a, I took her to a movie once. I said I have an advanced screening of the Young Lions with Brando. Do you want to go? Yes. <laughs> so I took her to the 20th Century Fox screening room on 57th Street, I think it was, and um, we came in, sat down, and uh, the movie started. Pictures called the Young Lions. And Brando doesn't appear for quite a while. There's a lot of it's cutting between Dean Martin and Monty Clift. And she turned to me after, and she says, who's that? It's Montgomery Clift, mm-hmm. Who's that? That's Dean Martin, mm-hmm. Who's that? That's Montgomery Clift. He was good there. Who's that? It's Dean Martin. He was, wasn't good there. She was like an acting class, and she's talking <laughs> a, a little bit louder than people talk in movies. And finally, Marlon appeared, and, and she didn't say anything. And he was talking with a very thick German accent, and he was very blonde and so on. And finally, after about a minute, she said, my God, it's Marlon! <laughs> <laughs> Loud. <laughs> <laughs> my God, he's so German. I wanted to go under the seat. <laughs> Somebody behind me says, Stella Adler. Anyway, she talked through the entire picture. Something must have happened. That's the way Marlon walks. 
It was a big plot point, but she didn't pay attention to the story. Everything was a scene class for her. It was very funny. I never took it to another movie. <laughs> Uh, you know, Peter, I wanted to ask you, um, you directed The Big Knife. The Big Knife, yeah. Yes. So was there anything uh, that you learned from Stella, particularly oh, on Odette's? Ev everything, everything. I learned everything about Odette's from Stella. And that's interesting you brought that up because that's what, the, I'll tell the story. Uh, I was sitting around a restaurant with five actors, one day after class, and I don't know why I said this, because if you have in scene class, uh, you'd have monologue, or you'd have a scene with two people. Never more than that. And I was sitting there with five actors, and I said, why don't we all do a scene together? I'll direct you guys in a scene. Everybody said, all right, okay. So uh, I found a scene with five good parts, in the, one of the, in the third act of, of uh, Clifford Odette's play, The Big Knife. And um, we'd rehearsed it, and we put it on. And five people get up on the stage, play the scene, and Stella stands up and she says, brilliant darlings, but you've been directed. Who directed you? And they all pointed to Peter. And I was standing at the back of the uh, auditor of the room leaning against the wall, and she looked at me and she said, bravo, darling, brilliant. So that's when I decided to be a director. <laughs> if she'd said it stinks, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> she was always very complimentary. My favorite story about Stella seeing a movie I made, I did a picture based on Noises Off, the play about uh, putting on a play. And, um, uh, I think it was the last film of mine that she saw. And it was about 400 people there, and when everybody left, she didn't leave her seat. She was with, she was with somebody, and she stayed in her seat. And uh, I went over to her, and she was wiping her eyes because she'd been laughing so much. And she looked at me, and she said, Who directed that? I said, I did. You didn't. I did. You didn't. I did. You didn't. I did. Brilliant, brilliant, darling. <laughs> Before we open this up to questions, did you have any last stories? I have one great story. Uh, it wasn't a tight-knit faculty, and we didn't have many meetings, but they did call one faculty meeting, and she was going to run it, and we were all a wreck, because she would, we didn't know what she would do at this meeting. Anyway. The faculty is sitting around the table, and uh, she finally introduces herself, and then she wanted to know who we were. So the teacher to her right uh, taught movement, and she says, darling, what do you do? And so the movement teacher went through a long esoteric explanation of movement for actors and so forth and so on. I was very impressed by her explanation, and Stella immediately said, darling, it isn't working. And she went around the faculty, one by one, asking each one the same question, what do you do? And to each one she said, darling, it isn't working. Finally, it's come to me. And I said, oh, wow, you've got to do something. So she said, darling, what do you do? I said, I teach voice, and I made a very simple explanation. She said, darling, it isn't working. And I said, Stella, what you do isn't working either. And she said, very good, darling. <laughs> so in that moment, either she understood something about you can't teach acting, don't have too many expectations. I'm not sure what it was, but it gave me a boost of confidence that um, I guess that one needs occasionally, especially from someone like her. And um, uh, I'll never forget that night where I got the courage to say to her, it isn't working, Stella. And, but she understood. You can't teach acting, actually. You can inspire someone, and you could... But what do you think she meant by it isn't working? The explanation isn't working? Well, or, it's just what Peter said a moment notion. ago. You have, she, would, she would say, you have to believe it, darling. You have to believe it. The one thing we can't teach an actor is how to believe. Yeah. You, you can't teach that. 
You can push them maybe to dig deep into their emotions so they can believe, but you can't teach them. I can teach you how to walk through that door and make a covered entrance. I can teach you that. I can teach you to breathe properly. I cannot teach you how to, breathe, how to believe. And if you can't believe, you can't be an actor. She would say the most brilliant things sometimes. I remember I uh, had seen Jason Robards do The Iceman Cometh by O'Neill off Broadway, and I was very impressed with it. And I loved the last speech, which goes on for about 10 pages. So I learned the entire speech, a very long, 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 long speech. I'm not exaggerating, it's about 10 pages. And um, I was about 17, 18 maybe, and uh, I did it, the whole thing. And she said, very good, darling, but you're too young for the part. You see, when you walk down the street, you walk in the middle of the sidewalk, but he doesn't. He walks close to the buildings. You walk closer to the curb, he walks close to the buildings. You're too young for the part, darling. I thought that was fascinating. I've been walking closer to the buildings than <laughs> older. Are there any questions? Let's open it up. Yes. Oh, sorry. That's a, I have some comments. I knew Stella rather well. I had started studying with you when I was very young. And she took a personal interest in me. And I'll never forget, she stopped the class cold one day and walked over to me and said, you look just like me. Well, I couldn't hide after that. And wherever I sat, it was sit up straight. It was do not walk that way, do not chew gum. And you mentioned sitting on her throne. Do you remember it was a high red chair? Mm -hmm. And she always wore black and was so glamorous. And then she had her two little dogs that Brando gave her, Mookie and Principe, and everyone but me would fight over trying to walk the dogs just to get her attention. And once she got so angry at me for something I did and literally told me to leave the class. And everyone gathered around me because after all, they all wanted her attention and she was paying attention to me. And I returned the next day, and she, of course, had this little smile on her face. And she had given me um, classes uh, gratis, and I was also at her apartment. And most unfortunately, I had spoken to Ellen and was at um, her funeral, but the private part where the family was. And she didn't just teach acting. She taught life. And she was a great influence on my life. And I'm so delighted that you're all here remembering her and recognizing her. And I cannot wait to see the film clips. Um, she was quite a force. And I hope everyone remembers her. Thank you. I think one of the things that's most uh, effective about the book uh, is that you really have a sense of hearing her voice. It isn't, the, the, Barry Paris did a very good job of editing the, the uh, talks into, into coherent chapters. And, but it's her voice. It isn't like writing, it's, it's her speaking. And it brings her back because she was really the most electrifying speaker. And everything was extemporaneous. I never saw her refer to a note. She would go on and on, and, and, and uh, I never, I never, did you ever see her look at a note? Well, she looked at them. I mean, she had them. In fact, it's interesting because one night when I was there, uh, I was at dinner, and she, I, you know, I was talking to her about publishing some of the lectures. And this is, a, I'm, I'm sure she had been approached over the years many, many, many times. And she said, go to the closet, it was in the hall closet, and there in the hall closet, I opened it up, and there were the, it was lined with shelves, and on the shelves were notebooks upon notebooks upon notebooks, from Aeschylus to uh, Theroyan to, you know, 
anybody, I mean, while, I mean, all, all the way up to today. And um, the fact she allowed me to publish the first book, which was on Ibsen, Strindberg, and Chekhov, which, were the, which was the European uh, masters. And um, we had made this two book contract. And it was, I felt as if it was my, um, that it was the legacy that my father had left me was to publish these. And um, anyway. Uh, so I, I might add that uh, Mitchell Wilson, her, Vicky's father, was a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, I think he was the love of Stella's life. I think uh, they were good looking, <laughs> elegant, wonderful guy. I went on, a, we went on a few dates together, Stella and I was going with somebody and we went, had a great time and Mitch was wonderful with her and she adored him. Yeah, but you know what he always said about her? He said, you know, she dresses for the second balcony. <laughs> <laughs> because if you look too closely, you're gonna see the holes and the this is and the that's. That's a very funny line. Um, any other questions? Yes. yes. Uh, this Wait is a minute. Oh, she's got the oh okay. okay. Uh, this is for Peter. Um, with all your many accolades, I loved, loved your role on The Soprano. It's terrific. Um, I was Thank wondering you. how how that role came about for you um, and as a non-Italian, and also what would Stella have said about the quality of the acting and the quality of the script of The Sopranos, which I just think was groundbreaking. I don't know what she would have thought. I think she, it was awfully well acted. Everybody was so good. Jimmy was great, and and Edie Falco was brilliant. Everybody, everybody was good in it. I think Stella would have thought the performances were superb, and the writing was very good. It was very, very well written. I got the part. Um, it was just a fluke. I, uh, David Chase, who's the creator of The Sopranos, called me out of the blue in 1992, uh, 93, and, and said, um, we're, I had just published a book of interviews with Orson Welles, and he had been dead a few years. And they, he called me and said, we're gonna do a special show about Orson Welles. On a, I'm producing a show called Northern Exposure and we're gonna do a special episode about Orson Welles. Would you play yourself and come to Seattle where we're shooting and we'll write a script and you'll play yourself and talk about Orson? And I said, sure. So they wrote a script and I went to Seattle, I did it. Second day of shooting, he calls me, he says, have you ever acted before? I said, well, yeah, I started as an actor when I was a kid. I've been, that's how I started it. Oh, why, is it no good? He said, no, 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 you're very good. You have a lot of presence. You should do more acting. I said, thank you. Seven years later, I get a call from David Chase again. He says, we're doing a second season of a show called The Sopranos. I said, yeah, it's a good show. I love it. He said, well, the therapist is having so much trouble with uh, uh, Soprano that she needs a therapist of her own. So would you be interested in playing the shrink's shrink? I said, sure, I would. So come on down, and I met the writers, and that's how I got the job. It was fun to do. The character was not Italian. I think he was Jewish. Elliot Kupferberg. It was so much fun. Definitely and not Italian. Not <laughs> Italian. The funniest thing was, just this is not really relevant, but uh, you couldn't change a word of dialogue. You couldn't change a word of dialogue or add anything. And the very last show, uh, David directed the very last show. And I had a scene with no dialogue with Edie. I was just giving her a handkerchief or a Kleenex because she was crying. And David's over by, back by the video screen and he yells out, ask her a question. Now this was unheard of. To ad lib a question? Ad lib anything? So I asked her some question. He said, ask her a better question. <laughs> I said, fuck you, you you're the writer, you dummy. <laughs> it's off the point, but anyway, I think okay. Stella would have thought it was a great show, I don't know. Uh, it, was, it was very marvelous acting in that. Um, so much has been said about her relationship with Marlon Brando, so much has been written. I was wondering if anyone was in the studio when Marlon was young, um, or if you know what that relationship was like, 
um, even as he got older, he always spoke about her and, and attributed a great deal of his ability to, to her teaching. He attributed everything to her. Right. So I just yeah. wondered but if you had an experience. But Stella always said she didn't teach him anything. She said he knew from yeah. the time he, she said he just knew. Yeah. I have a, a story, I don't know if it's apocryphal, about uh, a class that Marlon was in, and she was doing an exercise where she told the students that the atom bomb was going to drop in one minute, and, and they were all different kind of animals in a barnyard, and Marlon was a chicken. And so the minute she says, okay, the atom bomb is going to drop in one minute, so all the animals began shrieking and screaming and racing around, but Marlon, who was playing the chicken, just kept pecking at the food. And she says, yes, darling. No animal would know the atom bomb is going to drop. <laughs> but Mar that's what she said. His brilliance was he understood. And whether that's true or not, it's a wonderful story, and it's a wonderful lesson about acting. Well, there's also a version of that story in the book uh, where um, she says a bunch of chickens are in a yard and they, the bomb is going to drop and Marlon just sat there and she turned to him and she said, and everybody's running around, racing around, so and so, and Marlon, and she turned to Marlon and said, what are you doing, Marlon? I'm laying an egg. <laughs> She would, always, she would mention Marlon in class out of the air often. She comes from a very famous acting family. Yes. Would that have had any influence on her? Did she ever act with her father? Oh, she's, yes. She, she started, started acting. Yeah, go ahead. When she was about two or something. Three. Three, yeah. She was in the theater from a very young age. Um, and she was, she was in the Yiddish theater, and then she was... On va in vaudeville, she was also in burlesque, and yeah. she was. Uh, but she, her whole—I think her whole understanding of her favorite word, the size of acting in the theater, came from the fact that her parents were a king and a queen. So yes, yeah, she came from royalty, and when she was part of the group, and they were living like paupers, and she had absolutely no interest in living that way. Her notion of herself was very different. And that's, I mean, it all came from, from there. Yeah, she, she was, but she was very, um, she was obsessed with the idea of integrity and the loss of integrity. I don't think that I had a, I don't think I saw her once in my life, all the whole time I knew her, that she didn't ask me about my integrity. And, um, she, um, I, was in, I was about 17 or 18 and I was in class one day. And Golden Boy, a play by Clifford Odets, is about integrity, essentially. It's about the conflict between art and commerce. And um, she was talking about this play at length. And I was sitting over on the side on a, on a trunk of some kind of wardrobe trunk or something. And suddenly she turned and pointed at me and said, there he is, that's the golden boy. I didn't know what the hell she was talking about. But over the years I figured it out. What she meant was that I would have success, but that I would also be torn between art and commerce. So she tried to keep, she warned me all the time. One time she was visiting me in California and I had a, an old fashioned Rolls Royce I had acquired, and she, we sat in the, she sat in the back seat with me and we drove, drove somewhere, and she said, this is the way an artist should live. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, you know, she says, uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, so much, this has been lovely. Um, I wanted to also thank Vicky for bringing up the the aspect of Stella's personality, the question of loneliness, and, and, and you talking about how it changed your life when you started taking classes with her. And I think that what happened with so many of her students and why people gravitated towards her was not because of the, the acting so much as because of her, her philosophy, 
and her talking about life like a philosopher. And this was, I think, even before she started reading Kant and Plato. And, um, but at any rate, when you brought up the loneliness thing, it really surprised me that neither of you, it surprised me that you were surprised that she was lonely um, and that she felt that a writer or a, or, or a musician or any type of artist would get, would get most of their inspiration from that feeling of loneliness. And I think her more than anybody because she was brought up with this king and queen, like you said, you know, and, and neglected as a child. And, and that's why her childhood was so, was so unhappy. But I think that maybe I wanted to ask you, Vicky, what you thought about if you were surprised when you read that line that Stella was, lo was lonely. Well, I was surprised, which is why I made note of it. I, the thing that surprised me, I think, the most was that she said, I never had a happy moment yeah. in my childhood. That, that surprised me. Um, I mean, I can see, I've just you know, spent 15 years writing about a, a book about an actress, Barbara Stanwyck, and so it makes, it makes a certain sense about the loneliness. It's just that I didn't... I didn't see it in Stella, but in reading this whole book and in seeing what she's dealing with, she's dealing with this, this um, which I think was probably part of what she experienced as a child, this collapse, this tradition versus rootlessness, which is what she describes in O'Neill and in Inge and in, and in Miller. Um, and what she says is, it's the end of the American spiritual drive, and that it comes over to big money, and you know, again, the the, the artist versus the the issue of com commerce, and you know, living an ethical, an ethical, clean life. Anyway, if there's if, there, if there's one more question... Her, then... her, her mother was quite a character, I understand. I never met her. But Arthur Miller told me a funny story that reverberates. Um, he was at Stella's 50th birthday party, Arthur Miller. And Stella's mother was there, Sarah, right? And um, Stella turned 50. So Arthur goes over to Mrs. Adler, um, Sarah Adler, and says, And how old are you, Mrs. Adler? And she says, 62. <laughs> she says, well, wait a minute, that's very hard to understand. If Stella's 50, how could you be 62? She says, that's her problem. <laughs> Hi. I enjoyed this very much, and I just have one question in terms of her teaching method. How did she feel about the method, sense memory, and also what was the real nature of her relationship with Strasberg and the actor studio. Well, I can answer that one. Uh, she thought Strasberg perverted Stanislavski's teachings completely. Now, Stella is the only American who worked with Stanislavski. She went over to Paris and spent some time with him. And when she came back, she had lots of notes that I think Bobby Lewis published a book based on those notes, mm -hmm. Robert Lewis. And, um, but to boil it down, the difference was that Stanislavski said, that, and Stella said, that 50% of the actor's job is inter internal, and 50% of it is external. External meaning, do you carry a cane? Do you have an accent? Do you have a mustache? Do you have a, a lisp? Uh, ex that's external. Internal is the m workings of the heart and mind. And Strasberg reduced it to everything was 100% internal, which is why Strasberg actors couldn't play Shakespeare, couldn't play the, the big playwrights, because they had no sense of the external requirements. Now, Brando is a perfect example of a Stella Adler student, because he always brought the external 50-50. It, it was always 50-50 with Marlon, you know? When he played the Godfather, he stuck uh, Kleenex in his to, to make that jowl and you know and the accent and all that that's all external and the internal of course he was brilliant at so I think that was the big split between Stella and Lee and um, in addition the big split was for Stella what she would say is don't 
use yourself, use your imagination, because you are too small and don't bring us all down to your size. She was, it, it was size, large. large. Everything, the, the theater is bigger than life. And you know, what she says is, so when the, <clears throat> the playwright's job is done, you come along and say, I'll take it from here and just say his words. But you can't just take his words because the words by themselves won't help you. You have to take his soul. You have to take his life, his experience of life, his ethic, what he has said to the world. I'm talking about real playwrights. I'm talking about plays that have in them enough to change the thinking of the world. The thinking of the world was changed by Ibsen. Nothing was ever the same after Ibsen because he was a man who through his craft, through his talent, was able to say the truth. He was, he was able to say, to say it to a certain kind of audience. And, um, and she says, don't come you know, to just show yourself on the stage because you're special. You're not. You're a dime a dozen. <laughs> so on that note, I think let's turn it over to Stella, and we'll show the clips, and then you will see the genuine article. Thank you very much. I just want you to get through to the 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 uh, the situation of the middle class in relation to uh, what what I call the social situation. You cannot play him if you uh, if you read the play and know you don't know that you can't play him unless you know what I've told you. That we are gra gradually, without your knowing it, we are getting to his character. Yes or no? Yes. In relation to his ethic, if he belongs to a bank and the bank situation is utterly conservative in that time, then you would realize that his ethic is absolutely without any leeway. Now, the middle class had always the ethic of honesty and morality. Uh, honesty and morality. And uh, a lot of it early came from God. And God told you and he gave you the Ten Commandments and he gave you what is needed to be honest in your society. Now, with the with these changes from God, the institutions took over the moral questions. So the institutions, the church, and the bank, would say they wouldn't marry anybody that uh, had any suspicion. I don't think they still would in hi hire somebody that had a, uh, was arrested for something. Don't yawn, darling. Don't yawn. If you're an actress, you will not get tired. If you're a pishika, you'll get tired. <laughs> because you'll say, well, what is she saying? I don't understand half of what she's saying because I don't know. I only know me. <laughs> so anybody else doesn't interest you very much. Well, it so happens there is no you when you're an actor. You're only the character. Only, and if you'll give up that you, I shouldn't say that because I look as if there's a lot of me. <laughs> there is no me, believe me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you now, I'd be the most ignorant person in the world if it wasn't for a character that I have to study. I know so much about Norway, I can't tell you. I know the whole thing about Norway. I think I'll just give this up and talk about Norway. I am Norwegian, you know. Well, at, at one time, the government said to me, they said, you know, Miss Adler, you're in all right so far, but we advise you not to sign any more petitions. So help me God. It was a political moment, and I signed too many petitions for their, uh, from their point of view. 
Now, how many people must have heard the McCarthy period? Yeah. Yes. And uh, I was at the very tail end. They didn't know who to kill, so they got me quite at the end and got me down to Washington and don't sign anymore. That's what I mean by Mr. By, by the mayor. You don't go that far with government. They don't want you to go that far. The government is not there for you to monkey with. Now you say, I want a monkey. I don't want, I don't, don't dictate so much. Well, then you'll then take care. In other words, Mr. Bill, Mr. the mayor has power, real power. How many people understand? Yes. And the inclination when he says, I don't eat or I this or that, is to hate him, to dislike him, isn't it? To think of him as being a fool. How many people have changed their minds? He's not a fool. He represents power. And you know that at a certain moment, if there's a just one minute, uh, one thing, n gasoline is rationed, finished. How many people on the TV, you know, gasoline is rationed as of tonight? How many people say, oh God, yes? Hmm? Yes? You have no real power over government. If you have, there's revolution. Now, they don't want to create a revolution. They want simply to have change. So this sense of epic, the sense of big, the sense of size is something that has gone out in the realistic theater or there are no actors to play it. But it is big time. And I always say when you have to play Death of a Salesman in America, my God, they search from one, uh, but uh, where is there a man who can play it? There are very few. And it's a realistic play. And the reason for it is that you think, or you've been asked to think, or you did it for yourself, or I don't know who did it for you, is that being true is being nice, or this way, or oh, that's true, look, I'm true. Can I, don't I speak truthfully? Uh, that is not the truth. That is your miserable sense of boring everybody to death. <laughs> but certainly it has nothing to do with truth. It has to do with limitations on the part of the modern actor who doesn't know how to express an idea in language that is not iambic pentameter. Therefore, the search for this big actor. Now, I don't think he can be found elsewhere. Certainly not in England. Something else happens there. It's very interesting, but it's not awfully big. <laughs> First of all, I would advise you immediately to take yourself out of any book. I may refer to myself as a little example. Take yourself away. Look to that moment. Look at the men that he's dealing with. He's dealing with Nietzsche, darling, not with some goddamn foolish woman there that's telling you you've got to be programmed. He's dealing with people like that. He's dealing like people with Swedenborg. He's dealing with people that understand him and their problems that are your problem. He, but he's, these are the big people that are understanding it. I don't level with them. Don't level with these people. See what they have to say. For Christ's sakes, don't bring everybody down to our level. You have been abandoned mostly. Absolutely abandoned in every way. Now we're trying to get some point of view so you can act the man someday. You can act the woman who's in conflict. You have no, there's no way to make you act except pitsy caca business. I don't like this and I don't like it. You've got to stop it. We are with the great men. It's, uh, Mr. O'Neill said, I want everything of, Nietzsche, of, of Strindberg published. I will pay for everything. Mr. Sh Mr. Shaw, uh, Mr. Shaw did that and Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. O'Neill gave him the, the, the Nobel Prize. Now all these people are the playwrights you're going to deal with. We're not going to deal with the programmed lady. 
get yourself away. Let us deal with you as material, not as an evolved people. You are material. Mostly I can play this play, I can play that play, I can understand that man and this man. One thing I don't want to understand is Stella all day long when she's doing this and that. I don't need her. I need her in two and a half hours when she's concentrated as a third sex or she is defeated or she is a woman that wants to become like Nora or so, wants to become like something. I don't need this Stella. Do you understand? Material. A blackboard. People write on me. Yes? That's what you are. Will you stop it with yourself? I don't know if I told you and maybe it's wrong to say it. When a guy said to me, I'm, well, I'm a guy like Hamlet. I said, I don't think so. I said, Hamlet owned Denmark. And you don't have a pot to piss in. <laughs> <laughs>